Welcome to Governing Growing Cities, an International Perspective, the debut seminar of the Grattan Institute's Cities Programme. I'm Jane Francis Kelly, the director of the programme. It's also a pleasure to welcome Duncan McLennan, Professor of Economic Geography at the University of St Andrews. Duncan, as well as being a former boss of mine for a few months in 2005, is a leading academic on cities on three continents. He enjoyed a long career at the University of Glasgow, and it was in that guise that I first met him in 2004, when I was working at the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit in London, leading a review of government intervention in deprived areas. After moving to Canada in 2005, he held a joint appointment as Professor of Urban Economic Policy at the University of Ottawa, and as Chief Economist at the Canadian Federal Department for Infrastructure, and where he wrote much of the Harcourt Report on the future of Canada's city. Duncan's advised governments on housing and urban policy in the UK, Poland, France, Sweden, Ireland, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Australia is famously one of the most urbanised countries in the world, with our cities producing the bulk of GDP, jobs and carbon emissions. They're on the front line of responding to climate change and are almost all projected to significantly increase in size. How cities cope with the challenges we face over the next decades will be decisive, and effective governance arrangements will be a key characteristic of those which succeed. City governance has become a nationalist issue in Australia, um, the first time in a, in a long time, and it's timely to reflect on what some of the lessons from overseas might be as we get ready to deal with the many challenges facing our cities. So to start off, I'd like to ask, looking around the world, how would you characterise the global trends that are affecting cities today? Mm. I think you're right that uh, we're moving into a period when the way in which we manage places, the way we establish the structures in which uh, business, in which capital, in which labour, in which people operate, is beginning to be recognised as a really significant factor, uh, not just in terms of the environmental and social outcomes, but the economic outcomes that you can expect to see in a metropolitan, in, in metropolitan area and indeed an overall economy. Uh, after uh, a 20 or 30 year period where uh, the emphasis has all been on improving human capital uh, and improving business capital, uh, governments at last are getting to the issue of place. Now, I think this is particularly important because we are in an era, as you say, of increased urbanisation, uh, not just in Australia, but in the world in general. Uh, even in the UK, the proportion of people already highly urbanised is in increasing. Uh, I think the two general trends that one sees are clearly urbanisation, but also in the context of globalisation. And I think that what you then get, the typical city, uh, is one in which there uh, is sustained growth in employment and in incomes. Uh, I think globalisation brings people significant opportunities. It also brings with it increased inequalities in the sense that the bottom two or three deciles of the income distribution tend to get left behind uh, or at least show relatively little appreciable growth in their real income so that inequality and growth uh, rather go together. But you also, in that context, and this has been true across the OECD in recent years, that in fact house prices and land prices go up faster than wage rates and income so that there's an increase in the cost of land there's an increase of the rent sector, if you like, in, in our economies that goes with that process. And when you combine the inequality with the increased rent sector, you then are getting, in, you're getting growth, you're getting dynamic, really dynamic changes in city centres and uh, the kinds of landscapes you see here, but you're also getting increasing concentrations of low-income households very often displaced out from the city centre 20, 25 miles. It happens here, it happens in Toronto, it happens in London now as well. And in a context where uh, people face significant difficulties about affording outcomes for themselves, often where there's relatively poor social infrastructure. And at the same time as we get that, of course, growth in uh, terms of numbers also means spatial spread. Uh, sometimes it's more extensive than others. But essentially, we are having uh, a significant expansion of suburban areas. While city cores are strengthening and actually growing in population, the real big additions to city populations are out there 10, 15, 20 miles uh, out and even further beyond, not just in the traditional core centered city, but often in a whole network of places that connect very often around the edge of a metropolitan area rather than into the city core. So I think that 
these trends are fairly general, though, though they play out in detail and differently from place to place. And as I prepare to ask the next question, I realise that I should have mentioned that it is sheer coincidence that the first Grattan Cities Programme seminar has two Scottish accents up front. Um, that's not a requirement um, for uh, being involved in the programme at all. <laughs> Quite the reverse at this point, the quota is full. Um, so what is your view of how those global trends play out in Australia? Um, I think that uh, uh, the, the results are fairly obvious. I mean, there's been spectacular strengthening of the cores of all of the major cities uh, and expansions of these. I mean, the expansion in the CBD in Melbourne and into the fringe of relatively more affluent, now affluent neighbourhoods within five, ten miles out from it is really obvious. You can't miss it. And you only have to be away from here three or four years and you come back and you see physically, you know, a really substantial expansion, which if you were in Europe, you might have to wait 20 years for. Uh, so in a sense, it's visually obvious. It's also statistically obvious. If you look at uh, the kind of maps that the state government will produce here or uh, academic research shows, these patterns are really quite clear. And I, I, I would highlight uh, that I'm really impressed by the success of Australian cities and their cores, but deeply worried about the patterns that are emerging uh, out around 15, 20 miles out from the centre of Melbourne, uh, not just in terms of the poverty aspects, but as I suggested earlier, some of the environmental footprint uh, aspects. Uh, this is a, a country with very dirty environmental footprints. In Canada, it used to be dirty environmental footprints in the snow, so it was very visible. Uh, here it uh, uh, is a, a really significant issue. Um, I think that um, academia knows these things. I think uh, the newspapers and ordinary people know these things. And I think governments know them. But it's only in the last two years that at least federal government has recognized there are significant issues. And I think that uh, the Secretary of the Treasury's uh, speech dealing with some of these issues about urbanization suggests this is good, this is now on the economics agenda of the federal government, but it has to be at the heart of the agendas that state governments have in terms of rethinking places. It's not just enough to say that central Melbourne's fantastic, and we all see that. It's about what its life is like in some of the remoter parts of Dandenong, I think, becomes really the issue. So how it plays out, uh, the outcomes are reasonably clear. I think they're reasonably predictable but I think they're actually getting worse in terms of these concentrations of poor people and visible minorities. And some of the tensions round about that will become more acute. What's a successful city? And have you found that um, the definition of uh, what a successful city is has differed in the different places you've looked at? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think that the present trend in economics to look at the happiness of people um, although you find that happiness doesn't vary very much depending on what economic outcomes might look like. I think happiness uh, and uh, the, a successful city is one that keeps most people happy in a sense. So you look at the individual level. Uh, there are two worrying things to that identification. There's the studies of happiness in cities show that the happiest people in the world are Colombians. And it makes you wonder, is it the, <laughs> is it the coffee? Uh, there was also a study done of this in Toronto of the happiness of different groups. And this is really worrying because the Colombians were the happiest. And then the not credible bit was the Scots were the second happiest. Which <laughs> That's clearly wrong. I, th I think we must have beaten England at something the day before. The, that, that kind of news travels internationally quickly. But generally, indicators of happiness of the population, uh, whether expressed in surveys or in political behaviours are really important uh, and perhaps not taken enough account of. But I, I would say uh, the successful city, um, there's no single template, there's no single definition. Uh, if we look at it in terms of the ambitions that people have that they express through not only individual choices but collective choices, governments will pay, take quite different views about what they want to do and pursue within the metropolitan area. Some people weight environmental objectives stronger than economic development, and equally others will give more attention to cohesion. So what would be regarded as a great success in terms of uh, development in some European cities would be regarded as a sign of failure here? We quite like living in dense 
uh, arrangements, for instance, and uh, no doubt we'll touch on that later. But some of the things that would be regarded as really successful developments in some places might not be in others. So I think that uh, I would define uh, a, su a successful city as one that's actually achieving the outcomes that its people have, uh, in a sense, uh, voted for and uh, are trying to achieve through the uh, uh, public policy processes. Can you mention some cities that you think are successful? Um, <clears throat> Success is also, I should have said, it's not only variable, it's also relative. I mean, I think in a way, and this will strike you as peculiar, uh, I think Glasgow is an extraordinarily successful city uh, simply by the fact that it still exists uh, in that it uh, was in a downwards trajectory for most of the period from 1950 to 75. Uh, it lost something like 350,000 <laughs> manufacturing jobs from within its municipal boundaries and its population fell from about 1.2 million to about uh, 0.7. But actually, it managed to stabilize its position. It began to move forward. It looks better in terms of quality. And in the last five years, the uh, employment base has uh, successfully re-expanded. And actually, areas of disadvantage within the city have contracted. Uh, Glaswegians regard that as a great success. Um, and in fact, they'd be right to. But on the other hand, not that many people move there. So not many other people regard it as a success. In terms of cities that people would regard as successful, I think that uh, Vancouver is clearly a success, not only in terms of quality of life indicators and the kind of Mercer international ratings and the like, uh, but in terms it's got a high inward migration rate, people are really happy with the outcomes, and I think that it reflects high quality planning, it reflects uh, good governance, uh, and it, uh, it reflects a commitment to making it a really successful place. I have to say that I think uh, Melbourne stands up really well as a successful place in terms of creating a platform in the city centre for individuals to play, individuals to shop, and in fact the city to express a lot of its creativity. And I think that what has been achieved here over a 20, 25 year period, I first came here more than 20 years ago, it's actually quite stunning and actually people underestimate it. Uh, so I think that Melbourne's extraordinarily successful in that regard and less successful when you go beyond 10 miles. So I think that, uh, again, it's, it's relative. Uh, if you contrast Melbourne with Toronto, Toronto's an enormously successful economic engine. It brings more than 55% of the people in Toronto are born outside of Canada in that way it's like Sydney and it's like Melbourne uh, but it gets people into employment it's moved people through uh, there's upward generally upward social mobility although that's operating less rapidly than it did in the past so an enormous success but on the other hand not the same platform uh, in the city centre because lack of attention to infrastructure uh, I think underperforming as a potential world-class city and lack of any coherent planning framework out beyond the municipal boundaries so that you get social outcomes of uh, uh, quite affluent communities with no social infrastructure and apparently increasingly fat children uh, who actually, because they never actually get outside of the cars and there are negative consequences from that. So um, very mixed successes in some places. I also think that some European cities like uh, Barcelona clearly, uh, but you can also uh, think about it. some of the uh, cities in Eastern Europe that have transformed and are spectacularly successful in, in, in the roles and context there. And I think Berlin's a very successful city. Uh, so uh, different kinds of places doing different kinds of things. London I like, uh, and London's successful. It's all about variety, vitality, and venality. And I think that uh, uh, it does um, all three really well. It's a description worthy of Samuel Johnson. Also, when you put Glasgow at the top of your list, I thought never was an accent and an answer so well aligned. <laughs> so what, what, what are the factors that make some cities more successful than others? Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, um, over the long term, there's a set of structural factors that you can't ignore. The traditional explanations of economists and treasuries uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, if you look at city economic development <laughs> strategies, uh, 
or the European Union's done a lot of work in this and academics do, they always come out and say uh, the set of core economic things like the labour force uh, really matters, the quality uh, and price of labour, uh, the standard of uh, the, the variety of uh, human capital skills, innovation and creativity in uh, 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 the uh, business sector, the general business environment, uh, uh, the entrepreneurial nature of a culture, the tax regime, the availability of real estate, all these kind of core economic factors uh, obviously matter. And that's unsurprising because uh, that's basic economics. Um, also, connectivity and access. Uh, cities that have good connections, and particularly good connections through airports, have much higher innovation rates than those that don't. And it's about people being able to travel and sell ideas. This will be important in the Grattan Institute, of course. Uh, Travelling and uh, dealing with ideas is uh, really important in, in creativity. And of course, <coughs> uh, some of the issues about uh, geographical location and variety in the economic base is uh, uh, really quite important. Um, however, uh, people then say there are softer factors. Uh, Alfred Marshall, when he was talking about English cities in the 19th century and location and what uh, thrived and survived, he talked about atmosphere, the atmosphere of a place. And he wasn't just talking about fog, but he was actually talking about a creative atmosphere. So the issues about the quality of life uh, and place and amenity have become more and more important. Now, whether that's at an individual level or whether you go to the kind of Richard Florida creative classes, and, and that's a particular kind of, if you like, social cluster that gets created in places because of high quality, uh, that's important in some instances uh, in terms of uh, shaping uh, economic development. And on the basis of quality of place, you quite often can build identity and market and brand. So these things all build up upon each other. But what I would say is that these things are all important. And I think that any self-respecting state or city economic development agency would have them in place. It's what treasuries think about. What they have not thought about is what I call the place platforms, i.e. the basic systems that operate within the metropolitan area. You can have lots of the creative classes having a good time downtown, having ca coffee with international visitors like me. But if you can't get to your work, if your infrastructure's crap, as they would say in Glasgow, if the transport system's not functioning very well, as it wasn't yesterday, uh, and if people can't afford ha good housing outcomes, they won't come. It won't be effective. So this question about how you manage the place, and I don't mean just special initiatives for disadvantaged areas, but how you think about the metropolitan area as a system and how you deliver the outcomes becomes really significant. It's important in the economic base and in the economic issues that we have to confront. The competitive edge now, I think, all, all the cities that I work in know the list about be well tied into your universities and be innovative. They know about improving schools and early starts and so on. But the way that I think the bias there was against major capital investment programs and taking debt, uh, that's rather changed in a lot of countries recently, uh, the bias against that meant that governments avoided creating the right platforms uh, for economic development to actually take place on. And if, whether you look here or whether you look in the UK or Canada, what has stood up and bit economies at the metropolitan scale in the last 10, 15 years have been these shortages of infrastructure, have been these shortages of affordable housing, poor transport systems and the like, and they really matter for good economic and environmental outcomes. So turning to governance and thinking first of all about how, um, how to decide what, you know, how cities decide what they'd like to be in the future, um, how have cities um, that you've seen successfully prosecuted a discussion about where it is that they want to go and what they want to be? Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry to uh, refer to Glasgow. And I only think it's successful because it was a relative. I, didn't, I wasn't suggesting it was a model for anywhere else. I was making a point about relativity. But growing up in Glasgow, I became, um, and even working there for quite a long time, that the dominant framework for governments to think about place issues was not through urban public services, where there was an opportunity to do so, 
It might come in in terms of special renewal, uh, like programs to deal with disadvantaged neighbourhoods or growth management. But a lot of countries, not least Australia, uh, Canada, didn't do that sort of thing. So where does the uh, thinking about uh, how you have a, a sense of place and policy come from? Well, it always rested with the big planning departments. And the land use plan in Strathclyde region uh, 10 years ago in Scotland would have done Joseph Stalin a fair amount of credit in terms of the way that it uh, actually looked at land use allocation, uh, looked at uh, the outcomes. There was very little consultation with communities in the process of shaping the place view. There was very little consultation with service provision departments about the place view. There was no consultation with business about the place view. There were no feedback devices in terms of citizens' juries, uh, um, focus groups, whatever. This was a technical view of what would determine uh, the right geography, if you like, for metropolitan development. Uh, clearly, some planning departments have been more responsive than that. But I do think that there's been too much emphasis on the big metropolitan strategy as a framework, a blueprint. I hate the word blueprint mm -hmm. when applied to uh, 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 spatial planning because blueprints are, when people design ships, the last drawing, the last drawing that's never going to ever change. When the ship gets launched, you don't want it to change, not even when it hits an iceberg, uh, is the blueprint. Now, that's not, how, to me, how spatial change takes place. You, you, we are imperfect in our knowledge. Uh, we have to understand how these systems are operating best as we can, and we need to have some framework for moving forward. To say then it's going to remain fixed regardless is, I think, an inappropriate way to describe either the problem or the solution. So we have to have a conversation within government about how place matters. Now, the great pity is so many uh, government departments and I don't just mean here in the, uh, uh, the state of Victoria, don't actually think about place. There's not enough place expertise in different departments in terms of a capacity to think through what the health program means, and I know there's a good health department here, or what the education program means. Now, there are central agencies that can pull these things together, but that tends to be as a special effort. This should be in the mindset and the thinking. So I think that governments have to do better in terms of the conversation. And this is going to require uh, having a system that's somewhat more opened up, if you like, to a conversation about uh, place uh, and actually uses uh, partnerships wherever appropriate uh, and uses different kinds of institutions to get at uh, thinking for the city of the future. Quite frankly, uh, the best laid plans of mice and men, as another Scot once said, the, le the best laid spatial plans uh, now actually don't count in the public's thinking. Now, uh, they therefore tend to, uh, if anything, frustrate both uh, citizens and the uh, political process, and that what we should be thinking is much more about how we manage uh, change in a strategic sense rather than... I know that many planners have moved in that direction, but some haven't. Uh, can you give us any examples of cities which have successfully engaged with its denizens to have a conversation about the future? <laughs> denizens. I'm um, going to use the word denizens more, I've decided. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good word, it's underused. I felt that a drink just at that point when you talked about denizens. I always think of people in, you know, sort of deep down in bars drinking. I think of denizens. But that's because of my Presbyterian by origin, who's come out into the sunlight. Um, I think that uh, cities that uh, have engaged with this, um, I think that if you look uh, across, well, let's pick uh, North America, because in the United States, there's a fantastically uh, well-argued, well-researched series of ideas about neighborhood renewal and about city renewal. And a lot of the time, federal government programs, like under the Bush administration, try to mainly close these things down. Uh, under the Clinton administration, they were actually really effective and interesting. And what they did by starting at the city level was they have really effective partnerships uh, between both either at the metropolitan level uh, or down at neighborhood skills. Very often, the kind of problems you want to deal with in urban policy 
don't actually sit happily at the scale of government boundaries. The housing market, the labour market and so on reach out beyond the city boundaries. The, neighbor, the schooling effects of uh, concentrations, the health effects you want to change, the housing effect, very often they're down within communities at a much more uh, localised neighbourhood level. I think governments that have dealt with that well have established partnerships for change. Uh, I think that in uh, the US they, they've been really influential in cities such as uh, Chicago. I think uh, Mayor Daley there, in, well the most recent Mayor Daley, uh, was very effective in engaging not just federal programs but put in place a whole series of methods of discussion and involvement of people in the process at different scales. Uh, so I think that was an effective uh, example. I think that some of the city partnerships in the UK were also uh, effective. But we've now moved to a system uh, uh, of what's called community planning, where the local authorities, which are much bigger than uh, in Australia other than Brisbane, uh, are now required to take account not only of their own expenditures, but the expenditures of other programs and the expenditures in communities. But I think what that has done is basically throttled the community. It's embraced the community and crushed them to death because it's a municipal power basically saying this is what community does. Whereas I think uh, the institutions that have existed in other places have articulated different kinds of energies, connections and commitments.